Hello there. If you watched any of the m &E Pins videos, you know that one of the things we did a few years ago was build a LED driver board to drive strings of LEDs. Well, Mike and I are thinking about building a new enhanced version of that board. And one of the things that we want to add to that board is sound which would allow us to put in our own custom sounds instead of just using the ballet sounds. So in order to do this, I really need to understand how the ballet sound system works. So I'm probably going to show two or three videos on how I went about figuring out how the ballet sound system works. So to start off with, I'm going to show you the problem I'm dealing with, and then I'm going to talk to you about the data scope that I built to capture the data and the program that I wrote to display that data. Now, I'm going to kind of do this backwards in that I'm going to show you the problem, show you the solution or the results that I accomplished, and then go back and show you how I built the data scope. So uh, that's the plan. So let me uh, switch over to the screen and start to explain to you what the problem was. What you see here on the screen is a couple of pages of a ballet schematic. I think this is the Playboy schematic, uh, but most of the games of this era used almost exactly the same schematics. Signal names were changed, you know, according to whatever the, the game was, but this underlying schematic is exactly the same. So if you look over here on the left hand side of my screen, I have a bit of the microprocessor uh, schematic and down here at the very bottom on J4 uh, are the solenoid driver lines that are also the sound lines. And this is part of the reason why I had to go in here and figure out how they do that because they use the exact same lines to drive the solenoids and the sound simultaneously. Uh, so if you look, uh, the uh, pins one, two, three, and four are labeled A, B, C, and D, momentary solenoid slash sound data. And then if you look down here at pin 10, the solenoid bank select and sound select are also the same pin. And there's one more line that they borrowed from up here, which is pin seven of J1, which is uh, uh, used as the sound module E. So that gives five lines that are going to the sound module, which means that you could create a number anywhere between zero and 31 uh, with five lines. So you could have 32 sounds. Now, if you had a later version of a, a table that had like a squawk and talk board or something like that, they use a different technique. But right now I'm dealing with sound cards that use just five lines. Uh, so I wanted to see how this data looked coming out of here. Now, on the right hand side of this screen, I have the connector for the sound card. And if you look here, you can see solenoid A, solenoid B, solenoid C, solenoid D, solenoid E, and all of those feed over. Uh, you can't see it on the screen, but there's a, uh, a RAM chip over here, or a ROM chip that they, they become addresses of. And then down here on pin 10, is the solenoid select line, which fires off the sound card. So now the screen on the right hand side is showing the solenoid driver board. And if you look here, the same four A, B, C, and D come into this solenoid uh, selector and uh, the solenoid bank select line uh, comes into the gate on this a four line to 16 line decoder. And one of the key things that you need to understand is that the very last number 15, which would be all lines high, 
is not used. It is left open. So in the momentary context, you can have 15, 0 through 14 solenoids being used, but you can't use the 16th solenoid, which is line number 15. Uh, that is reserved because whenever they uh, are putting out a sound signal, they raise all four lines so that they don't fire any solenoids. Uh, so I needed to see what the timing was, how this worked, and, uh, and how, how exactly Bally accomplished all of this uh, so, that, so that they could get both the sounds and the solenoids driving off of these two lines. So now I'm going to switch you over to the software that I wrote that displays the data that comes from my data scope, uh, and we will see what that looks like. Now, fair warning, I've only got a couple of days of programming into this uh, data scope display software, so there are certainly may be bugs in it. It isn't the best thing in the world, but it accomplished what I needed to accomplish. So before I start, I just need to explain a little bit about how the data scope works. Uh, I built a data scope that as fast as it can takes samples of the lines and stores them in memory. And it keeps doing it over and over and over again until it fills up memory with captures. And then it dumps that all at once into a log file. And this program analyzes that log file. Now, because I'm only reading six lines, I'm reading the strobe line and the five data lines. And since I'm only reading six lines, I have a lot of space in a 16-bit word. So I use the other 10 bits as a counter. So if I take a sample and then I take another sample and it's same as the first sample, I just up the count. And so every 16-bit word can hold uh, 1024 samples, assuming they are all the same. But as soon as the sample changes, it goes to a new location and then it starts counting how long that iteration stays the same before it moves on. So I'm going to go ahead now on my data scope and load one of the files, which I have stored on desktop. and. There's a capture. Now, if you look at this, this is a capture that lasted about 50 seconds. Uh, and it has 26 million captures in it. So I captured a lot of data. The duration of each capture, I, besides capturing the data, when I start my log, I take a time tag and I capture the data until the buffer gets full, and I take another time tag. And that allows me to average what the sample time is for each of these captures. They actually vary a little bit because the loops aren't all the same length, but for my use, it's, it's way more than accurate enough. Uh, so a sample time is 1.9 microseconds, or about 2 microseconds. So you can see here that this is the data. Now, the, if you look at the legend up here, the strobe is the bottom blue line. The next four lines up are the one, two, four, and eight line, uh, which equ are equivalent to A, B, C, and D. And then the very top line is the E line. So these four lines right here, A, B, C, and D, or one, two, four, and eight, are used by both the solenoid driver and the sound card, and the top line is only used by the sound card. So I can pick a point that I want to look at by just clicking in on it, and it'll center that, and then I can use my zoom tool here that I put in to allow me to zoom in on this particular Setting. So let me click that edge, zoom in just a little more. There, there is a bug in this code that at certain zoom points, the data looks like it wraps around. 
I don't think that's my bug. I, I think that's uh, Microsoft's bug. But anyway, I can get close enough with this. So, uh, so with that, I, you can see that the strobe line goes low right here for this period of time. And while that strobe line is low, this line is high, this line is high, this line is high, and that line is high. So if all four data lines are high, that means that this is a sound strobe because th there's no solenoid data there. Now, the way the sound card works is on the rising edge of the strobe, it delays, I believe it's five milliseconds. Could be wrong about that I, i'll look on it says it on the schematic uh, before it actually clocks in its data now i added a second cursor that lets me look at times so let me pop the second cursor there and you can see that from the edge of this uh, to there is only 10 microseconds. So what this thing is doing, which would mean it's about five sample times or maybe six sample times. So uh, the microprocessor is setting all the data to the high state and then knocking the strobe down. And as long as this strobe is down, if there was solenoid data there, that solenoid data would be active. Uh, but there is no solenoid data there, so there is no solenoid active. And then we get to the trailing edge of this time and something like five milliseconds later. So let me go out here somewhere and see if I can find five milliseconds. Um, that's only a quarter of a millisecond. So let me uh, zoom back out a little bit to get a little farther out. Okay, so I'm at one millisecond there. So let me zoom out some more. So if that's one, five should be about there. That's close. So somewhere right about there, the microprocess, the sound card will accept that strobe after its five millisecond delay, and it'll look at the lines. And now you can see that this line is high. So one is high. Two and three are low. Um, eight is high, so eight and one is nine. And 10 is, or I mean, 16 is low. So this is a sound of 10. So it's gonna, the card is gonna play sound 10. Now, when we build our card, we will have sound files that are, are playing through an I squared S interface into a I squared S DAC but we will have recorded uh, that sound and stored it there or replaced it with a sound we like better. Like I said, the whole purpose of building this sound system is so that we can put our own custom sounds in. So let me zoom all the way out and see if I can find a spot where a solenoid is being fired. Okay, this area right in here looks pretty interesting. So I'm going to zoom in on that area, actually, right here uh, where this long low period is on the strobe. So I'm going to zoom in right there or select that and then zoom in. And, uh, and so now what you can see here is the strobe line goes low and line one is low, two, three, and four are high. So at this point, solenoid one will be firing. And it will fire up until this point. So it's firing this solenoid for about 140 milliseconds. And then that line goes high. So now all the lines are high. So no solenoids are being fired. But then at this point, so line one and four are active. 
So now solenoid 5 will be firing. Notice it didn't have to change the strobe, light at all, strobe line at all because nothing was happening. Um, and then if you zoom on down, I'm going to have to actually zoom back out a little bit. So if you, at this point right here, the line goes back high again, right there, all four solenoid lines are high. So no solenoid is being fired. And it just holds that uh, for this whole period of time. Uh, let's see where we're at here. Uh, we're about uh, almost four seconds of time. The strobe light stay, strobe line stays low that whole four seconds because it's not firing a solenoid and it's not making a sound, so it doesn't care. It's not going to change anything. Uh, but all of a sudden it needs to make a sound. Some rollover happened or something. So it needs to raise that strobe line. Uh, so let me zoom in right here. I'm zooming in fairly low so that so that you can or fairly tight so that you can see that it raises the strobe line while all those lines are still high and then it waits uh, just a probably one clock cycle in the microprocessor of the Bally, uh, uh, 17 microseconds, maybe two clock cycles. Uh, and then it, uh, it lowers the lines that it wants for a sound. So at this point, uh, line one is low, line two is low, line four is low, line eight is high, and line 16 is low. So this is 16 uh, plus 4 is 20, 22, 23. So at this point, this machine was playing sound 23. By the way, the machine that this is in uh, is a nitro ground shaker, if anybody cares. And so I was using the Bally schematic because I have a clean Bally schematic. The nitro schematic that I have is horrible. Uh, but it all kind of works the same. So, so that shows you how this thing is doing. So now that I know what these timings are and I can pick them up with this data scope thing, uh, I'm able to analyze how the microprocessor clocks out all this data, what it cares about, what it doesn't care about. Um, I can't wait to capture uh, a squawk and talk. Uh, because it does two data transfers. It, uh, after the solenoid line goes high, <clears throat> it waits a little bit, transfers four bits. It doesn't use that line five anymore. It transfers four bits, and then it waits a period of time, switches and transfers another four bits to give you eight bits of data or 256 sounds. Uh, so that's going to be neat, but I don't have that yet. And right now we're only dealing with these, these five line sound cards. Uh, so I've already built a tester, another microprocessor, that will allow me to generate test sounds that mimic what this thing does. Now I'm just going to step through all of the sounds from 0 through 31, and that will let me record whatever... Uh, sounds come out for each of those numbers. So we have a place to start with our um, data. So we're going to just capture the Bally sounds and use them initially uh, until we generate our own sounds. So, so that's the plan. Now I'm going to stop here with this video. Uh, in the next video, I'm going to step into the code. This is written in Visual Studio. It's actually pretty short code, uh, but I learned a few things while I was doing it. It's actually my third Datascope code that I wrote, which made it a little easier and a little faster. Uh, but I'll, uh, I'll step you through and I'll show you uh, how I use the uh, Microsoft Visual Studio uh, capability to make this actually really easy to do. Um, so 
that's going to be it for today. I hope you enjoy this. Like and subscribe if you want to. I'm not into big subscribing. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a little little place and we're not monetized or anything like that. So it really doesn't make any difference. Uh, but it's nice to see when people like what I do. So thanks a lot and have a good day.